Jigash. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, some issues in time domain astronomy, um, similar to some of the talks that we've heard uh, yesterday, and I think probably what, which we will also hear later on today. Uh, so I apologize if there's reiteration of material, but I, I guess that's what happens in these sort of areas. So we're in this burgeoning area of time domain astronomy. Um, where for the last 10 years or so, I mean, some people say we're entering the golden age. I think we've still got a ways to go before we're there. But we have a variety of surveys and facilities, new instruments, um, some you've heard mention of, um, Catalina, PTF, ZTF, LSST. We're doing it in the optical. We're doing it in the radio with things like SKA and the, the, uh, ASCA, the SKA pathfinders. We're doing it in space missions. We're doing it in all sorts of different wavelengths, and of course now we're doing it in gravitational waves and more exotic type phenomena. So there's a lot of um, sort of growth area and lots of people thinking about the problems that are, are coming in this sort of time domain area. Um, my particular interest is, is optical surveys, of which there's still a large set. And uh, in optical surveys, we have a large number of photometric surveys which have been going on for about the last 10, 15 years. Um, which have been producing data over most of the sky, so we're now getting cadal baselines. Um, there are some spectral surveys which are a beginning. Um, there is a, a, a program with the Sloan to get second epoch spectra, so now we're moving into this area of trying to look at spectral variability, possibly in combination with photometric variability as well, which gives us more information about what, how things change and looking for similarities between the two. Um, and then there are other surveys, LAMOST, has done a big spectral variability survey. PESTO is a, a public survey for, for doing, sort of taking spectra. So we're moving to this area. Uh, one of the sociological problems, however, is that a lot of the, um, the surveys, they're happy to put out allow, uh, announcements about we've, we've detected something that went bang last night or wasn't there before. Um, so they put out real-time alerts, but then they're not so good at putting out the archival information which allows you to do the big systematic searches that a lot of us are interested in doing to look for the needles in the haystacks. So um, there's a sociological survey, there's a sociological change we need to push through as much as possible. Um, the ones in red are the ones where the data is not necessarily public. Uh, the ones in sort of purple are the ones where the data is coming to public or being public soon. Um, the ones which are in blue are where the data is are already public. Um, but, you know, if you want to find a light curve for any object pretty much in the sky, you'll be able to find it today, maybe with a decadal baseline, certainly from Catalina. If it's fainter than 20th, maybe from some of the other surveys. But this is one of the issues that, you know, we believe we have a wealth of data, but actually in the public domain, there's not so much data out there. There's a lot of data we really need to put out there which would make things a lot easier. That hasn't stopped people. I'm sorry about this horrible pixelation thing. It's something to do with this, not my talk. I, I'd never do that. But anyway, um, one of the problems this brings, uh, this hasn't stopped, however, uh, people doing automated classification. So you have these big data sets, and you think, well, I want to try and then put a label onto uh, as many of these objects as possible, because then I can find the subset of this particular class, and then I can look at the distribution of this and find the interesting objects in that. And so there's been a variety of work in all these different surveys over the last five, 10 years. Richards et al, you've heard of, is one of them. There's some work we've done with Catalina. But you know, people are looking at these sort of things, doing this automated classification. And so um, this is sort of what I want to sort of focus on more um, for the rest of my talk and some of the issues with automated classification. So if you had to define a pipeline or what, write a workflow for how you would automatically classify a data set, of course our data are not nicely sampled. We saw that yesterday. They're regular, they're gappy, they're heteroscedastic, yeah, they're noisy. Um, it's real data, it's not the data that, uh, that statisticians like to work with. Um, so that means that if we want to compare even data for objects taken on the same night, we may often have different samplings and, and all sorts of things. And so what we need to do is go from inhomogeneous data to some sort of homogeneous representation. And we either do this through some sort of regularization where we, you know, we interpolate onto a regular grid or whatever. Um, which can bring all its own inherent problems, or we, we go for a feature representation instead, which gives us a much more uniform representation. 
We then say that there's some ground truth which we, we associate with a training set, we specify labels, we do identification of clustering within that training set maybe. Um, if we're happy with the labels and the ground truth on that, we'll train a classifier on the training set, um, pick random forest, pick support vector machines, pick convolutional neural networks. It doesn't really matter which one you're going for, they pretty much do about the same sort of performance. Um, you may want to do ensemble methods, so have a sort of two-tier approach, sort of wisdom of the crowd sort of thing. Then, of course, you verify it on your test data set, and then this will give you false negative and positive rates, or it may give you an ROC curve you want to, if you want to be a bit more exact about knowing how well you're doing or where, where the areas are. And then, of course, what you do is, you know, once you're happy that you've got something that works to, to the level that you're, you believe you can get, you apply it to the full data set, so, you know, you've trained on 100,000 objects and then you apply it to the 500 million that you have access to. And this allows you to either do population statistics to say that this class of object occupies this bit of a high dimensional parameter space, or to do outlier detection and say, well, these are the objects which don't clearly fit within this class or have some sort of strange behavior that this particular representation we have that captures. So, Let's look at some of these, in, in. so we have interesting objects like this, and we have boring objects like this. These are both AGN, which is the sort of uh, trans or the, the sort of class of object that I'm interested in. And of course, to be able to compare these, as we say, we're saying yesterday, we come up with these, uh, these feature representations, um, and, and I hope that this defines some sort of high dimensional space where these, these different objects will stand out as occupying different areas. Um, sort of common statistical features that we see in the literature, time scales, lump scale, gilf period, variability measures. Um, Ashish talked about stats and indices yesterday. There are sort of measures of morphology, statistical measures, um, flux ratios, that sort of thing. People look for trends, linear trends, or maybe slightly different trends. And then there are these sort of model decompositions where you look at Fourier amplitude ratios, phase differences, whether you're looking at normality tests. Um, in some ways, these are very lightweight features, I would argue. Um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on identifying features which have more of, of a physical phenomenological basis in terms of that we, we understand that we're doing, we're dealing with physical objects and we're dealing with hot gas and we're dealing with, you know, gravity and that sort of thing. And we can think that there are physical processes which are involved which may be chaotic or they may be long-term memory processes or they may be... Um, you know, turbulent process or whatever. And are there features that we can identify from that basis um, which would allow us to, you know, detect the, the signatures of those things in time series? And so I think there's a body of work to be done there. And that's some of the stuff that we've, we've, um, we've sort of thought about a bit. Um, one of the other issues, though, is, you know, in a lot of this statistical analysis, and I know that James is going to talk more about some of the statistic issues of, of, of this stuff later, um, you know, there are a number of un, unstated assumptions that we make when we talk about these things. Um, we've already talked about homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity, or Ashish mentioned it yesterday, you know, it, it's, it's complete fallacy to believe that our error model can be the same for all of these. Um, another thing is that the, the, the data is not necessarily identically and um, independently distributed. Our data is, is time series, it's sequential, and if the delta t between the, uh, the observations is sufficiently close together, that means that the errors will be correlated, um, which, which could be problematic. There's this other general assumption about, about stationarity, so that the generating distribution on the underlying process is, is time independent. But again, this doesn't need to follow. There's this particular object which uh, Eric Feigelson is, is um, keen to point out, which has at least 20 variability states in it, 20 different in identifiable states in it. So it's clearly not stationary. Um, there are these GARC models, which actually don't describe AGN particularly well, but it's a form of autoregressive model. And in this, you treat variance as a stochastic function of time. And non-stationary time series don't need to necessarily be stationary in any particular limit. I mean, we sort of assume weak stationarity, but there's no reason why, you know, very turbulent gas flowing around in a strong magnetic field should necessarily be stationary. Um, there's also this idea of ergodicity, the time average for one sequence is the same as the ensemble average. 
um, and you hope that uh, observations uh, sufficiently far apart in time are uncorrelated and that new observations give extra information therefore about what's going on. Um, this is uh, somewhat untested. I mean, we sort of assume it when we do it and hope that it's true, but um, it's not necessarily tested and you, you could, you know, there may be processes out there where, where it's not true. We've also heard that all features are not equal. There's been a number of papers, um, including the work that Ashish talked about yesterday, where people have done this sort of feature analysis uh, to see which features are, are relevant. And, and clearly, you know, if we throw 100 features or 50 features at our time series and you do this sort of, it's very clear that there's actually just a handful of features which are actually carrying information about the sorts of things that we're interested in. I mean, one of the problems is that a lot of these features are highly correlated. Instead of having one measure of, of scale or one measure of location or one measure of variability strength, we tend to throw, throw five or ten in there, and they're all capturing broadly the same thing. So I think this is, again, another reason why I'm, I'm more interested in things like you know, put in a Lyapunov exponent, which will give you maybe some, um, some measure of chaos in your system, or put in something else which is going to, you know, if you're limited to the amount of computation time you have, per light curve to, to extract information, we should be a lot smarter about the sort of information we want to extract. The most important feature that comes out from a lot of these analyses, particularly with stellar astronomy, is period, because a lot of stars are periodic. Um, and there are many features which are based, first of all, you find the period and then assuming a period, and we saw this with a lot of the stuff yesterday, there are things that we can do, you know, fitting a Fourier series, deconvolution, that sort of thing. Um, but what's interesting is that there's been some analysis to Bath that all showed a 22% 22 mis, 22 misclassification error um, with an incorrect period. So if you get your period wrong, it screws up the rest of your system as you go down the line. And Richard et al. showed that, you know, periodic feature extraction routines count for 75% of the time. So you better get your feature right, because you're spending most of your computation time on period-related feature extraction. Um, but there are domain knowledge constraints that are coming in um, about whether, you know, having a single number for a period is right or not. Kepler, uh, Kepler um, analysis of R.R. Lyrae have shown the sort of Blaschko behavior, which is where you get period flipping. Um, they've also shown small amplitude cycle-to-cycle -cycle modulations in RRIB. So our idea that RR Lyrae have a single period and don't change is, is changing as we are getting more into time series analysis. Um, there are close binaries and, and long period variables where the cycle period changes over multiple decade baselines. We're finding these things now with, with the dash, um, for example, the, the, the uh, digitized photographic plates where we're getting these multi-decade baselines. We're beginning to see how these things change. What's the period in that? Semi-regular variables, which make up a far a large chunk of, of stellar things. They have double periods. They have multi-periodicity. You can't, can't really have a single period feature for that. It doesn't make sense. Um, what about things like armor models, the sorts of things that um, Jackie was talking about yesterday when you have the, the, the peak in the, um, in the power spectrum that gives you this quasi-periodicity. Is, is that a, a, a true feature or is it a, a statistical feature of the process? And then there's the trustworthiness of quoted periods that we see in the literature. So uh, period finding is not a single algorithm as well. You know, you can go and look at all the, I think there are at least 25 different period finding algorithms in the astronomical literature over the last... 30 years, Lomskargel variance, you can do this least squares fitting to a set of basis functions, pick your choice of basis functions, or you can do this sort of more non-parametric phase, phase dispersion measure and phase space approach. Um, and then there are sort of more sophisticated ones you do. Which one is the correct one? Which is the best one to use? So we did an analysis a few years ago on this and came to the conclusion that from a general set of stars, no algorithm is generally better than about 60% accurate across a field of classes of, of stellar populations. Now, if you could take one small class, you can, of course, fine-tune your algorithm to be good for that. But if you want to say, here is a set of data, find me the period of everything, generally you're going to get 60% accuracy on your period and, and no better. All methods are dependent on the quality of light curves and show a decline in period recovery. Um, some are stable with uh, small numbers in, some are not. 
Um, algorithms tend to work best with things which are sinusoidal, so pulsating or eclipsing variable stars. If you have things which have a non-sinusoidal non waveform, you get problems. Um, and there are some algorithms which work better with you know, performance constraints and all sorts of things like this. But are we necessarily using the best features? Um, there's a lot of domain knowledge, as I've said, we should be including into this sort of thing. We should also be modeling time series via generative models rather than th these sort of discriminative features. Because I, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we could then do and it, it's, it's much better for our analysis and we can maybe uh, begin to identify whether we have deterministic or, or specific stochastic components in our time series as well, which then helps relating that back to the, the underlying physics. Um, moving on to the classifiers, which classifier should we be using? Should we be using random forest? Should we be using, you know, anything? Doesn't really matter. Um, ag again, if you do the analysis, there are certain classes which are uh, preferred more by certain classifiers than others. Um, you can get better results if you use an ensemble classifier, something like a generalized stack classifier, which is what this is. So you have two levels here, you have a whole suite of different initial ones, and then you take the results of that and that gives feature vectors for a sort of second tier one which you can then use. And that gives you um, the sort of you know, wisdom of crowds type approach and you can go from 90% accurate to 99% accuracy. So that's maybe one sort of thing we want to be thinking of. There's an issue which came up yesterday, of course, that we, how do we deal with these uncertainties? We have these all sorts of uncertainties, our time series of observation areas in flux and time, we never really consider in, in astronomy the time areas. Um, regularization or imputation add interpolation uncertainties, model parameters, hyperparameters have their own uncertainties. Feature representations don't traditionally deal well with these, and this is an issue that Raphael brought up or was, it was, it was certainly concerned about yesterday. And of course, they'll introduce their own uncertainties. How do we do this? Um, really, we want to be working with full PDS for each classification. The uncertainty quantification that um, group five, is it? Group seven? I forget which group is. Do you remember? No. Yeah, there is a group who's working on this, so, which, is, which I'm, I'm pleased to hear. And we can either do forward uncertainty propagation or backwards uh, inverse uncertainty propagation. But it's, it's one of these things that we, we need to be concerned about. Um, a caveat with um, automated classification. Um, Kim et al. 2014, they used a random forest classifier to automatically detect periodic variables in the Earth 2 data set. So Zinsky et al. 2016 did a reworking of this and they found that four and a half thousand, or nearly, nearly four and a half thousand sources were missed in a new collection of RR Lyrae in the same data set. And what they found is that there are about 3,000 which have a, 3,200 3, which have a counterpart in this database and they looked at them and they found that uh, five percent were probably RR Lyrae but 95 percent that were supposed to be RR Lyrae were misclassified. So the automated classifier was stunningly wrong on, on RR Lyrae. And so this is something we've got to be really careful about in, in these sort of bulk analyses. Um, you know, um, yeah. It's, it, and, and, and it's nice to see this sort of reproducibility type approach coming in because it gives you a, a degree of certainty. Well, it gives you maybe a degree of your faith. If you, can, if you can reproduce the results fine on the classification using a different approach, it gives you some certainty that the classification is better. Obviously, in this case, it shows that the Kim et al. stuff is not so good. Um, but this then goes to the heart of how do we establish the ground truth? I mean, the ground truth will never be 100% correct. The classifier could have been mistrained. Uh, the labels that it was using may have been wrong. Uh, if that's the case, that will raise false negative rates in the data. And if you're dealing with a 100 million object data set, a 1% misclassification rate is highly significant. I mean, that's you 1 million objects that are misclassified. And if you're going to a 30 meter telescope because you think you've got a very rare object, and that's going to use your one night of 30 meter telescope that you've got for the next two years, which is a realistic amount that we may get, you know. One of the problems is that there is a lack of community agreed training sets in stellar variability. Do you go to the general catalog variable stars? Do you go to the variable star index? Do you go to Simbad? They all disagree on certain objects on what the class is, which one is right. 
Who is the, you know, so we need to do something about this in the community. Also, our known class sampling is biased towards certain classes and not representative of the real stellar populations. People are interested in periodic variables are a liary, particularly because they can use to probe galactic structure, but they represent a small fraction of the overall stellar population. What are all those other stars? If you look at this machine, um, this is work done by Jerry Richards itself, a machine uh, classifier. 20% of their objects were semi-regular variables, 20% of objects were small amplitude red giants. RR Lyrae in that data set is, is a few percent. So, you know, there are these objects which are much more representative of the stellar population, which we don't, we just sort of lump in this big thing. There is this general question about categorization. Anyhow, you know, if you define what a triangle is, you have a single definition of what a triangle is, and it's immutable. Problem is our definitions are based on historical knowledge, and so that means they're based on snapshot samples and the hope that in these, when we've done this and looked at it and said, oh, this is one of these and this is one of these and this is one of these, that we've actually captured enough of objects at all phases of the, of the evolution of, of, of stellar or, or galaxies or whatever. Now, you can have analytic class definitions. You know, these are ideal, these are theoretical. I have a model of how stars work, and I believe that they should follow that, and so this is clearly one of those. Or we can have synthetic classes, which are more pragmatic and maybe slightly more nuanced. It's one of these, but it's doing something like this. This is an RR Lyrae, which is also part of an eclipsing system, for example. Um, but what I would argue is that with these big services like LSST and ZTF that we're moving into, we're now entering this era of precision classification. People talk how we are entering the era of precision cosmology, but we're going to have so much data out there that we can actually go for this sort of pragmatic, nuanced approach to say, you know, what is actually in the data in terms of what can we see? There's a small group of objects which behave like this, and we're going to call them, you know, class X or whatever, but we have a good idea of what they do because they occupy this particular region of space. Um, class distinctions, well, but how many classes do we have in our data set? You know, we can have a very high level definition where we say it's an extrinsic or an intrinsic uh, physical mechanism which is going this, or we go slightly low level and say it's eruptive, pulsating, rotating, eclipsing, cataclysmic. But one of the problems is these sort of standard automated classification assume, uh, schemes assume mutually exclusive classes. Um, but we know that there are RR Lyries in eclipsing binary systems. So is that a pulsating variable or is that an eclipsing variable? Or is it, you know, so fuzzy clustering maybe allows multiple memberships and it's maybe the sort of things we really want to be thinking about. Do we want to go to unsupervised learning to determine clusters, but then if we do that, which clustering paradigm are we going to use? Do we want to do partitional, hierarchical, density-based, that sort of thing? And are the clusters that, you know, if I throw an unsupervised learning algorithm at a data set and it tells me those are f there are five clusters there, are those physically realistic or is that just, you know, the partitioning up of that particular data set that I have? Um, an important class that we need to be considering actually when we're doing anything is this other class. If you go back to this machine learning classification, they had 60% of the objects were in the miscellaneous class. This, the, these are things that don't fit any of the other classes that I found. So this goes to some of the stuff that was being talked about yesterday. You know, if you have something that's 85% RR fine. What happens if it's 20% all of those classes? Well, then you shove it in the miss class. And actually, in the Catalina periodic variable catalog, the most accurately classified class is the aperiodic noise class, because everything in there is aperiodic and noisy, but you know it's aperiodic and noisy with a high degree of certainty. One of the other issues we have are, if we're looking at outliers, these extreme objects, um, there's no reason why the characterized variability of every type of observable source in the observable universe over a decadal baseline should be Gaussian. And it's probably not. But one of the issues is that if you assume that you're looking at then a heavy tail distribution, you can't assume a generic heavy tail distribution because it can't be estimated. You need to actually pick a family or a class of heavy tail distributions if you want to assign a significance value to your outlier. There's also no formal, def there's no formal statistical definition for an outlier that I can find. Um, and you can show that the presence of outliers has no connection with the existence of heavy tails or with experimental error. Um, there may be other definitions of outliers that we want to be looking at. Um, I'm playing around with some topological data analysis stuff to 
to sort of define things, uh, uh, outliers as something with high persistence, so it never really, and marginal connectivity, so, you know, in your um, connectivity of your data set in your high dimensional space, these are things that always don't connect very well. So it may give us something that's not density based. There are further challenges for automatic, more automated classification, data fusion. I mean, we've talked a bit about this yesterday. What happens if I have multi band or multi wavelength data that I want to bring together into a single analysis? What happens if I have different surveys in similar pass bands? What are the ways that we need to uh, attack these data? The main adaptation. Uh, quite a lot of discussion yesterday. Less discussion so much on performance and hardware, but you know, if we have 100 million light curves or 500 million time series that we want to classify, we want a very low mean characterization time for a time series. And what computational resources are available to us to do this sort of work? And what happens if I get new data? How do I do the reclassification? Are there streaming techniques that I can do which will mean that it's just a delta on the computation time, or do I have to redo the whole workflow again? So, you know, th there are challenges for methodologies for, for this sort of thing. So, in summary, um, with these very large data sets, automated classification is required, but there are a number of caveats to be aware of on this. The choice of features is very important. Um, the inherent assumptions in using those features we need to be very clear on and we need to be very clear with the astronomical community what those assumptions are so they're not just going to pull something off this shelf and use it incorrectly and what the dependencies are. We need to know how uncertainties propagate through the system. I think you know, there was discussion yesterday on that that we don't have a clear idea of how that works through that. You know, how do we construct the PDF properly from all this? The choice of learning algorithm, if I'm doing machine learning, seems to be relatively unimportant, but there are dependencies on that as well. Uh, ground truth, we had some discussion about that yesterday and what it assumes and reflects. Class assignments available and their realities, and then there's this issue of, of outlier detection. Um, and then there are further considerations about the, you know, the data fusion, bringing stuff together and performance. Um, but the promise is that there are, you know, if we have 100 million time series, and you've got a phenomena which is a one in 10 to the thousand or one in a million phenomena, you can still get a collection of objects of a hundred or a thousand. And this is a statistically significant sample then that we can really use to probe some very, very interesting science and very interesting physics. So I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you. Any work that has uh, actually looked for features and tried to classify with features that are physically motivated rather than just geometrical? Uh, yes, we've done some stuff with it. Uh, I mean, we've tried using, we've tried throwing a lot of stuff at, um, you know, Hurst exponent or the Lyapunov exponent for doing chaotic sort of behavior. We've looked for some sort of non-linearity features. Part of the problem is that there are, you know, finding ones that work with the regular time series. Is, is a big issue. Um, and then finding ones that work well with a regular time series where you don't have a lot of data points like we have. Um, so, but there are one or two which seem to be, um, may have discriminative power to some degree, it's, but it's unclear yet whether they're picking up statistical artifacts in the data or, or whether they're actually, you could use them to identify different classes. Um, we, we just haven't had time to sort of do that work properly. But I mean, we have um, Ashish and I and a couple of other folks are sort of looking at this sort of thing. Um, but you know, the, the, there's a vast amount of literature out there in not only in stats, but in other sciences where they do these sort of things. You know, climate science, they're trying to do these sort of analysis. And we should be taking what they're doing and applying it to our data and at least seeing if it works. I was thinking yesterday that we astronomers should start reading, I mean, at least people doing time domain should start reading papers that are not on astronomy. Yeah, I already do, so I mean, yeah. but, but I mean, there is, there, is, there is stuff out there, but it, it can be, I mean, but then we need to understand the subtleties in applying those things to our data sets and, and that make sure it's actually working and whatever. And that's where we go to the statisticians then and say. And very quickly, your claim that um, the choice of the learning algorithm is, unimportant is based on 
having read a lot of papers that use different algorithms, because as you mentioned, state of the art is random forest. That's yeah, so uh, the references I find. No, but I mean, so I mean, there are people who use random forest. There are people who use, you know, Ada Boost or, or or stuff like that, and they'll say. If you're getting above 90%, they're all going to get about above 90%. And I think given the vagaries of the data sets that we have, 93% versus 91% is above 90%, and that's as good as you're going to get. If you're claiming you're getting to 99%, then that's a different matter. But they all seem to be about that 90% area. Now, it's when you start doing, when you start doing the ensemble classification, then that's when you get the boost up to 99%. Um, and, and then, then, uh, and if someone claims 100%, I get very concerned because I think they're overfitting the data. Then, um, you know, no one has a perfect classifier like that. But yeah, getting 99 from 90 is very important because if you are looking at say one million objects, then 10% of one million is a very large number. Yeah, right. And those number of misclassifications is very bad. Yeah, but if you're claiming 99%, you need to give me a very good proof that you're at 99%. No, that has to be a gold standard, 99%. So I think uh, one of your comment was about the, the period finding 60%. Uh, it's about 60%. So was that, that uh, study based on some simulated data? No, it was based on real data. So where, I mean, how the periods were known to be ground truth? So we did a, a small crowdsourcing, and we did wisdom of crowd. I mean, we've got a couple of people who are really expert at identifying periods. Who would you could consider to be main experts, and then we also had other people looking at the same object and sort of seeing do you do you agree if you don't agree. So I mean there is there is there is an error there is still an element of error in our ground truth, but it's at a, the order of a few percent, not at the order of forty percent. Um, and we ha we were working with a sample of at least twenty thousand periodic variables. So, you know, the 60% the is broadly across the, the class of periodic variables. Now, if you're talking about a specific class, then you can get a much better accuracy than that. But, you know, this, this idea that you have one period-finding algorithm which you can use to recover the period of everything, there is no silver bullet out there. I think, you know, we need to, be, we need to have a, a number of them that we're throwing, or we need to have better period-finding algorithms. Is there a... Uh... I mean, I'm just curious, I mean, is there a need to develop a method that works across everything, or can we not just uh, work with period finding that works for a particular class? Well, if you, if, I mean, the whole point is this automated classification. If I have 100 million objects that I want to classify, and it's going to get the wrong period for half of those, I'm going to get the wrong labels for half of those, and the, wrong, the features, the, the period, the features which are then dependent on me having a good, the right period, are going to have the wrong value, and that's going to give me the wrong label on, you know, on the out when it goes through my classifier. So I, th I think what we've found, with st at least in the stellar variability case, is that period is you know, it's the sig most significant feature when you do this, uh, the, the feature extract, uh, the feature reference. And at that being the case, we should put more effort into having you know, a, an absolutely solid period finding algorithm that has subtleties and nuances. I think James has, has, has done work on this as well. Um, to, to some. And I think it also connects to the screening question that Matthew mentioned. So if you don't have good signal, good period for a set of objects, you can see things like the point is available, you would want to know that we can now have a period for that. And when the next point is available, you want to know that we have a period for that. And until then, it is an unknown type. So we need that for every type of object. And then if we could connect that with the kinds of things that David is doing. And if you predict that if you use an observation at this point, then maybe you can get the right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think there's also this issue that, you know, as you know, Kepler data means we're getting these better time series. Um, and a, a, a single period, I mean, what do we mean by a period? We, uh, you know, at best, we mean something that fits 100 years of data that we have. And why should, you know, what is the lifetime or what is the time scale for certain classes of physical behavior? They may not, it may be, you know, several hundred years, but this period is not something that's going to, and we know stars evolve. So that to say it's periodic is, is you know, so I, I think we're moving to this era where we need to have more nuanced ideas about, about things like this. Because we certainly have the data to support it and to do the data mining. 
So were people able to get to the bottom of uh, why the EROS data had so many misclassifications? Was um, it because the physics was not uh, incorporated? Yeah, I think they do in the Sujinsky paper. I can't remember the details offhand. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, yeah, and... But I, I guess there's also merit in not incorporating the physics and letting the data speak, right, in order to be able to discover sort of the unknown. Yeah, no, there is. I mean, the, 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 this is the count, that's the, the, the flip side, that if we, if, we, if we put the physics in and assume that our knowledge of physics is right, you're only ever going to discover things which agrees with what you're looking to find. So I think having this, this combination of the sort of supervised approach where I'm putting the domain knowledge in and also the unsupervised approach where let's just see what the data Data says I mean, it's a it's a weighing of you know you want to do both um, but you got to be aware that what you think may be the stunning outlier is actually just a data artifact or most times will be a data artifact so you um, you mentioned that uh, that you know stars evolve so there may not be a real period um, so when you said 60% um, are the other ones things that do have a period if you folded it, uh, you could find like something that was a good. These were these were all objects which were claimed to be periodic variables, and the the forty percent that you were not found were either because of stellar class, or because signal to noise ratio, or I mean there are common uh, there are a number of factors which meant that the those particular algorithms got a wrong answer. Lomskargill is great for things that are sinusoidal. It's not good for things that are non-sinusoidal. So you'll get the wrong period in that particular case if you throw it at something which is non-sinusoidal. So across across the algorithms, kind of at least one found a period that was reasonable. Yes, yes. Which is why throwing maybe several algorithms or having something which is, you know, maybe having some sort of ensemble period finder. And I think some of the things like Super Smoother actually do, but they take a long time to run relative to, you know, I can brute force Lomskargill on the GPU in a fraction of a second. There are some that I need to run for 30 seconds. And, you know, that's a, you know, so we, we need to have, we need to be thinking big scale data for the sorts of stuff that's coming down line, but we need to have maybe some more sophisticated approach than it's just going to be this, you know, maybe some sort of filtering or whatever. I don't know. Thank you, Matt. Okay.